Broadcasting the information the mainstream media won't touch. This is The Richie Allen Show in association with DavidIke.com. Our first guest was diagnosed with cancer and given six months to live uh, around 20, just over 20 years ago. Whenever somebody says that, I often wonder how I'd react if somebody said that uh, to me. It was at this point that she woke up and was shown how we really heal and how we don't. Went on to study. She did uh, health and well-being and focused on, among other things, energy medicine and how to successfully treat humans and animals, often when conventional medical practitioners had given up, and she's done that successfully. During her research, she became aware of the 1939 Cancer Act and Clause 4, which is still on the statute books. She's actively campaigning to have this clause removed, and interestingly enough, she is on the Parliamentary Committee for Integrated Health Care. It's a, a, a thrill and I mean that to welcome Julia Fairfax to the programme. Julia, how are you? I'm good, Richie. How are you? Really well, thanks. And, you, well, if you listen to this programme every now and then, anybody who listens to this every now and, then, now and then will know this is something that I have enormous interest in. And I'm going to talk about Clause 4 in a second. But your own story, Julia, is a remarkable story, that, isn't it? Could you possibly explain to anybody what it's like to get that you know, to get that message delivered, you know, eyeball to eyeball from a doctor. Uh, your time is up, love. I can't um, imagine what it's like. <laughs> well, it, it's not something I would ever wish. Well, uh, do you know, this is the weirdest thing. It was 8.30 on a Monday morning. Um, they time it perfectly and this poor little junior doctor came into my room. I was about 26, 27 at the time. And... I'd been in the hospital for about four or five days for tests, etc. And I was feeling much better. And he comes in with, you know, a right face on him, to put it bluntly, with a sheaf of papers under his arm. And he just looked at me and just went, you've got six months and we're sending you home. There's nothing we can do. And it's ovarian cancer. And literally, as he said this, and, and in hindsight, I could feel this death sentence coming towards me. And at which point this voice from within, located around, uh, you know where your solar plexus is? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, right from there, from, from there, this voice comes out of me louder than the doctors, going, no, you're not gonna die because you haven't yet done what you're here to do. At which point my ego, this other voice, kicks in going, what do you mean you haven't yet done what you, I haven't yet done what I'm here to do, but I'm terribly important and I've done yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. and this. Yeah, it was really quite comical. <laughs> and that was when I suddenly learnt to distinguish between our real self and our fake self, for want of a better word. And I just listened to this voice because... You you have to understand, at the time, I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in a bigger picture or I couldn't... I I, At the time, was direct studies in a a business college in Cambridge. I was working with messed up teenagers and I was working with Bosnian refugees. So, and all I saw was the horror of what people can do to each other, not the goodness. So I'd reached a very... um, a negative viewpoint on human nature and to my mind it's like how can there be a god or a bigger picture when all this shit goes on on earth so as far as i was concerned it was do the best you can play hard work hard hurt no one and then your time's up and so suddenly i'm confronted with this voice telling me how the verdict of the medics is right but I don't yet have to die because, one, I haven't done what I'm here to do, and two, I was then shown by this inner voice of how I'd, been, how I'd reached this point, all the stories in my life and my lifestyle that had led to this verdict and what I needed to do to make it right. And it was literally like being um, watching a movie of one's own life, So it was showed me all the trauma stories that had led to this verdict. It showed me how my body was so acidic because at the time 
I didn't drink much water. I drank a vast amount of coffee. I drank a lot of alcohol. I mean, not excessive, but at least, you know, the normal average, about half a bottle every night. I smoked 20 fags a day. Um, I exercised, but not regularly. And I was stressed to the hilt with what I did for a living. While you're doing all that, yeah, you're working 60 hours a week. It's a perfect, yeah. perfect cocktail, isn't it? Oh, Recipe man. for disaster. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The ideal cocktail to be given that diagnosis. You could so, have had a heart attack, Julia, let alone cancer. <laughs> your, your heart might have stopped. Uh, no, no, my heart's way too strong to, to, to kick in, to, you know, to, to stop working at any time. Um, so I then did what this voice told me to do, which was to clear all the cells of my body of all of these stories and to forgive myself. Have you heard of something called the Ho'oponopono? I have not, no. I'd be a liar if I said I did. What is it? Okay, it's, well, this is all stuff I subsequently discovered after my own sort of uh, transformation. In Hawaii, as there is in all indigenous cultures, incredible natural methods of healing. And they all work from the premise that ultimately all healing comes from within from our own connection to self and to source, for want of a better word. Now, in Hawaii, they have this incredible, for want of a better word, a prayer, and it's simply four statements, which is, I am sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And this has been proven to have the most profound effect on our structure, our well-being and our relationship with self and all others. And this was confirmed. Uh, I'm kind of digressing a little bit. There's an incredible guy in Hawaii. He was Japanese Hawaiian in the 60s. I think his name was Dr. Len or something like that, who did the most incredible work with all the psychopaths and the sociopaths in this particular mental hospital who'd been locked up and literally like the keys thrown away. And you can Google him. He was the most incredible man. And true story, all he did was he would come in and he wouldn't even see any inmates. He'd just hold their files and do this prayer over the files. And literally within two to three years, Nearly every single person had um, transformed themselves. Wow. You know, amazing. And so what, what this did for me was I, I, I was then, my specialist then came in mid-morning and the first words he said to me was, do you have Booper? <laughs> right. The magic word in health. And for our, yeah, I'm just going to say for our listeners overseas, they would be a very well-known provider of healthcare, but well, basically medical insurance, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was in a state hospital, you know, good old NHS, and then suddenly he comes, the special company goes, do you have, you know, health insurance? And the only perk I had from my job at the time was, yeah, full, full medical cover. And his exact words were, because you don't forget stuff like this, you know, ever. It's no. indelibly printed on your brain for, for the rest of your existence. And he goes, I, and his, his words were, I have a feeling about you. And with your permission, I'm going to transfer you to the private hospital and I'm going to operate on you this evening. So, which obviously I agreed to, because obviously I didn't really want to die. And I knew I needed all the help I could get. And this is why I'm an advocate of integrated medicine, because personally, it was a combination of surgery and this own healing from within that got me better. So I got transferred. I'm listening to this voice the whole of the way through the day, showing me how to release and clean my cells and my whole body. And it said there wasn't enough time to dissolve the tumours, which has been proven by an amazing guy called Greg Braden. Um, but there was time to clear the cancer. So to cut a long story short, by the time... Oh, yeah, and that was the other thing. In mid-afternoon, he came in and said, did I want the option of having children or just a straight in and out? And I was like, you know, I want the option. So he said, well, in which case, I'll be there in as for as long as I need to. So he operated on me that night, removed more tumours than um, he'd ever ever come across, wrote a paper about it in The Lancet. 
for the most tumours removed by from someone's organ uh, uh, ovaries. And when and I and oh yeah, and I died on the operating table. And this was the other classic thing: having been one of those people who didn't believe in anything. Suddenly, I'm, I'm you had a near death experience, yeah, or a yeah. death experience even, yeah, yeah, which have been well and truly, you know, documented now. And you know, all of us say exactly the same thing. You know, this there is a very much a bigger picture, and it's incredible. Anyway, so I'm looking down on my body, that classic thing, and I'm just going, there's no way I want to go back in that body. You know, you're back in the light, you're back in this divine bliss that is. And it was, I was just looking at my poor battered body with drains hanging out the guts and the whole shebang, and I was just like, there's no way I'm going back in there. And then and then I could, the the, the specialist and his head nurse had their hands over my heart, were either side, calling me back into my body and I could feel their love for a complete stranger and then I became aware of how difficult it was to hold love on earth the, all the interference and it was like I knew then I had to come back one to help people realize that one there's life after death and two that you don't need to die of cancer and, the, you know, there are ways through it. And so that was that. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body and it hurt like you wouldn't believe. And then the slow road to recovery and, and there was no cancer. That, this, this is the most amazing thing. So the, you were told that you had um, ovarian cancer yeah. and uh, malignant tumours. Yeah. And the tumours turn out not to be, yeah. they turn out to be benign. And this yeah. is what you were, this was communicated to you. Yeah before i mean this is amazing what did they say when i mean what did the hospital think did they think well we've screwed up the tests or well to be honest i was off my face on morphine no but later on you know later on when they're reflecting on this did the hospital say we must have made a complete mess up of this nothing and to be honest i was so thrilled to be okay i never went there because i'm not by nature i don't believe in this thing of sue the pants off everyone i don't agree with any of that stuff you know, it just goes against my nature. And to my mind, I knew what it was about. I knew that they were right and that what had happened was just a uh, healing. And in my subsequent work, I've seen this happen with others. So, I, you know, so and that was the kind of beginning of the journey. But, of course, then I went into survivor's guilt because my father had died of cancer a couple of years before, who I adored, who was Irish, funnily enough. And well, with, with, yeah, 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 I'm not I, so, yeah, yes, people are. So I was from um, my neck of the woods, I reckon. Yeah, he was. He was a Wexford boy. Yeah, in Waterford. Yeah. And yeah, ne- next door to you. Yeah. And how um, incredible. Yeah. So he when he was dying, this voice within me, my kind of intuition, as I now know it to be, kept saying, you know, you don't need to die like this. But I just put that down to not wanting my dad to die, you know? Yeah. So that then basically afterwards, I'm a trained analyst, you know, so and ironically, I'd worked in competitive intelligence for the pharmaceutical industry. What's competitive intelligence? Oh, this is a mighty market. Sounds like spying. It sounds like a a lovely way of saying spying. In a way. (laughs) In a way. Water it down, yeah. Yeah, I worked for an incredible organisation called Skiller, run and owned by an extraordinary man called Moish Tov. Um, who provide healthcare data for all the pharmaceutical industry. And um, I was uh, paid very well to locate data on markets across Europe. I covered 26 countries and I projected markets for five years. And so I knew in my heart that the pharmaceutical industry was only ever interested in bottom line profit, not well-being of people. Never have been. No, sadly not. There are, don't get me wrong, I personally feel the vast majority of scientists and doctors and nurses around the world are the most incredible people, but they are restricted by their methodology and by their belief system and their training. I've had a client who was at, under the diagnostics of the Royal Marsden, which is, as you know, a big cancer hospital. Famous one, yeah, yeah. 
and they asked their oncologists what the oncologists felt about if the if this if they worked with me and just used the diagnostics of Mar, of the Royal Marsden. Their oncologist turned around to them and said, "Off the record, I highly recommend it. On the record, I have to say you are not a, it is not in your best interests." They said because all I can do is I can only prescribe radiation or surgery. Radiation or surgery, yeah. But the interesting thing is, and my sort of subsequent research, the Queen Mother, God bless her, had breast cancer in the 1970s, which is not a well-known fact. And she, with obviously the amazing homeopathic doctors and so forth that they use, discovered the healing power of mistletoe. How do we know this? Remind us. How do we know what? How do, how do we know this, that not only um, did, did, did she have breast cancer, but that she was, um, you know, exposed to... Mistletoe uh, ho- therapy. Yeah, and homeopathy. Because, yeah. because of her, mistletoe therapy is now on the NHS. Brilliant. No, I'm just asking, because our listeners have been going, how do we know this? Yeah, yeah. Um, because, oh, it's, uh, well, it's private. I can't, dis- I can't reveal my source on that one. Okay. You have to just go with it, and it's true. Um, so... Mistletoe therapy is actually available on the NHS, which is incredible. However, they don't tell you about it. Well, I was just going to say this, Julia, because the reason I pressed you on the Queen Mother is because our listeners would be, most of them would be, would carry a belief or would hold a belief that the the cabal, the powers that be, Mm. um, use and practice the very treatments that they want to ban. Well, you know, this is the interesting thing. I've worked... At close quarters with people from all levels of society and someone who's very highly connected wanted to open a fully integrated hospital in this country. I'm going back about 15 years now and they were not allowed to do so because of the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And this person you would think would be able to do it. But we're prevented from doing it. I'm going to do a quick recap here. It's 17 minutes to the top of the year. Julia Fairfax is on the programme. Over 20 years ago, diagnosed with ovarian cancer, given a told time was up effectively. Um, She was woken up by uh, an unknown, um, I suppose, uh, energy or or entity that said to her, look, it doesn't really have to be over. Uh, You can heal yourself. And there are ways of doing it. After being operated uh, on, it turned out that the tumours, which were numerous in her body, were in fact benign and not malignant. Uh, Julie went on to study uh, energy medicine and lots of other uh, treatments and in recent years has successfully treated people and animals when conventional medicine hasn't worked or when people have given up. It's terrific to have her on the programme. Um, and I want to move this on, Julie, because I did mm-hmm. say to you, time does fly, boy. Doesn't it? Doesn't it fly? And I want to talk about the 1939 Cancer Act and yeah. Clause 4 and um, you being on the Parliamentary Committee for Integrated Health Care. Mm-hmm. Tell us about Clause 4 in the 1939 Cancer Act. What is it? OK, to quote the exact clause... No person shall take any part in the publication of any advertisement containing an offer to treat any person for cancer or to prescribe any remedy therefore or to give any advice in connection with the treatment thereof. And in plain old English, Julia, that says there ain't no cure for cancer. If you say there is, we're coming after you. Yeah, Right. <laughs> Simple as that, right? It would yeah. put three exclamation marks after it. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of star signs. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of star signs. So this is um, 1939. Yeah. Um, we know through, well, I know through reading books written by people like Ghislaine Langto, uh, people like David and others, that way back when people knew that there were uh, natural ways of treating tumours and cancers and having great success even then way before then it was well known but here comes along this act why was that why why do you think julia i mean you can probably only speculate why do you think that was put in to that piece of legislation that particular clause at that time in our history why is that 
I personally feel that, okay, this is my own, this is only my feeling, right? That at the time there was an incredible woman in Canada and the States by the name of Renee Cass. Yeah, I've heard her mentioned before, yeah. Okay, who had come up, she'd been come across this old Native American remedy called Essiac. And she'd opened clinics in various locations in Canada and the States and had successfully treated literally thousands of people. And then she suddenly starts being shut down. At the beginning of the war, we suddenly have the development of nuclear fusion energy. The National Radium Trust had been set up. And for sure, you see, I don't like to think that anyone isn't... uh, I personally work from the premise that everyone is always doing the best they can with the belief system they currently hold, right? Right because I look at my own journey through life. So my feeling is, is that what had happened was that they discovered that radiation did destroy tumours, because it does. But what they hadn't taken into... And, and at the time, it was the only treatment around, apart from um, Essiac, but you can't um, make money off natural herbs in the same way you can from a generic remedy, you know? The... Um, medical profession, as it is the conventional approach, was suddenly kicking off big time because you had the demise of acupuncture, homeopathy. The, the, the kind of the whole system was being closed down. And suddenly they can... And, and the, the, how an amazing, effective way, because cancer was suddenly on the increase, which I think partly is due to the radiation of the planet from Hiroshima, etc., and the change in diet... Um, and stress, you know, modern stress was starting to kick in. So it was a great way of completely removing any form of other treatment because really what the medical framework, not the doctors and nurses themselves, but what the pharmaceutical industry loves is, is, are people who are not really quite right, you know, because that's how they make money off you. Of course. It's interesting. One of our neighbours where we live whom I obviously won't mention, worked for one of the major pharmaceutical firms for years and admitted, after we briefly got to know him when we moved uh, here, um, admitted that, you know, most of the time he was operating, he was um, basically giving perks to doctors for using certain products, including weekends away, concert tickets and stuff like that. Now, that's no big surprise because Glaxo were fined uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions for that mm. and other uh, companies as well. But um, he didn't have any shame. Uh, that was OK. He was doing his job. His bonuses were good. Mm. That's the way these um, corporations operate. But you see, I think also, you know, I, I'm not, I don't feel it's right to apportion blame because the pressures on all of us to provide for ourselves, our families, you know, invariably most of the time you're caught between a rock and a hard place and i totally understand why why people do it you know i'm i I don't feel it's right for me to say it's right or wrong i get it i know what you're saying let he without sin cast the first stone and all that exactly but uh, but when it comes to this sort of thing i can honestly say and i can only speak for myself julia uh, i've committed plenty I've made plenty of mistakes over the years and I've let people down at times and I've not been a great person, um, you know, at many times. Um, But I've been pretty consistent through my adult life. I can't operate like that. I've walked away from good jobs because I can't operate like that. As I said to you privately, you know, I weep and rage almost daily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I am seeing people every week whose bodies have been ravaged. And when you think there are now um, this, I don't know whether you know this, have you come across a guy called Moss? His surname is Moss. I was doing some research, Ralph Moss. Have you come across him? No. He's an amazing researcher into health and the appalling practice that is currently called cancer treatment. And he, a quote from his his research, I had a brain cancer specialist sit in my living room and tell me that he would never take radiation if he had a brain tumour. 
Imagine that. The, the oncologist you're... himself or herself. Yeah. And yeah. I asked him, but do you send people for radiation? And he said, of course, I'd be drummed out of the hospital if I didn't. Yeah, I know somebody's told David this and it was in one of his books. Jesus, you know, yeah, it, yeah. And this is why, I mean, I have tried through the parliamentary committee to get them to look at the clause for and get it removed. And I sent you the email. Um, yeah, that's of, right today, yeah. Of the response that I got. And that was why I've come to you, because it's like, how many more millions of people who are un will have to undergo treatment, which has a very low success rate and who are not given the options of SIAC, you know, apricot kernels, um, mistletoe, THC oil, you know, um, alkalizing their body. When is anyone ever told to alkalize your body? No, you know, never. Oxidative stress, you know, antioxidants, oxygenation, yoga, super greens, you know, cut out the sugar, cut out the dairy. When is anyone ever told this stuff? Do you have any sympathy with the claims made by people like Tullio Simoncini, who says that, now I've interviewed Tullio on the programme before, he's a friend of David's, and uh, when I first spoke to him, I gave him the run around, as any half-decent presenter should do. Absolutely. You know, I, I put him to the sword, but he had good answers. And he said he's had success, and he's not the only one, of treating tumours, particularly stomach tumours, with um, bicarbonate of soda. And this is usually laughed out of town yeah. whenever it's mentioned by anybody. Well, you see, I can see, I can, you know, I'm... I can understand I'm, why it's laughed out of town because bicarbonate, I'm, I'm only about five feet from bicarbonate of soda because <laughs> we all have, we all have it. Some of us brush our teeth with it. We, totally. we, we do all sorts of stuff with it. And, and, and next thing guys like that come out and, and Tully was a proper oncologist. He was struck off, of course. Yeah. Um, but he believes that. Now, I know damn well because I've been around the block a few times, that Simoncini does believe that. He is not a liar or a charlatan. Now, when I interviewed him, I told people that they should speak to their GP, they should speak to uh, the people that they are referred to by their GP, speak to everybody. Don't listen to that, take it as gospel, and then ignore it. And, and, and that's the responsible thing to do. Yeah. And I would never do anything else. But I always felt, and I spoke to him on television in London as well, uh, Simoncini and I always felt that he believed it. This is not a gangster and um, this is a man who believes it you know mm. um, I shouldn't I mean, be asking you about specific stuff like that but people have mentioned all sorts, GC, yeah, math no, I and mean, everything. I'm very happy yeah. to talk about specifics I'm very happy to talk about anything um, I can well believe it I, I personally come from a viewpoint that I don't think you have to believe in anything for it to work because I've had people come to me and in particular when I started treating horses and one of my f the first cases I had, I took one look at the horse and went, no way. No way can the horse come back from that leg injury. Yeah. And my w work's done through dowsing. And the, the answer came back, yes, this horse can get better. And all the way through the treatment, I, my mind was going, no effing way. No way can this work. And within three months, that horse was better than it had ever been, to the point whereby the vet scanned its leg, which had had terrible, terrible injury. And it was completely gone. And there was not even any sign of any scar tissue. Marvellous. So and this, I've seen the same things with humans. And I can understand the principle of bicarb of soda because it alkalizes the body. And one of the key factors that is behind cancer is acidification of the body. Now, the body... Is, common, common in fungus, of course. Yeah, candida. Can, yeah, that's it, right, which is what Simicini talks about, yeah. Yeah, candida's a big one. And when you think about your average lifestyle, of which, you know, I can totally identify, I like a drink, I like a smoke, I like to go out, but my diet is predominantly healthy. It's, you know, but if you think about most people's diets, it's heavily laden with sugar, it's mostly instant, you rarely, if ever, drink enough water. You do a huge amount of caffeine, a regular, usually, amount of alcohol. Now, all of these and mobile phones, the radiation of mobile phones is a massive one, which no one wants to hear. Nobody wants to talk about that. You're no. absolutely right. We've covered it extensively on the programme, and it's crazy conspiracy oh. theory. Yet, oh, no, we're it, all conspiracy. That's right. And you know, because you've been... 
you know, you've worked within the pharmaceutical business, you're an analyst, you're a data analyst. You know that no health impact study has ever been done on Wi-Fi radiation. Never. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a case of we're going to put it everywhere, everywhere. We're going to put it in your homes in the, in the form of smart meters and everywhere else. And um, it'll be all it'll be all hunky dory. Oh, no health impact study. Let me read a couple of quick tweets because we've got about 10 minutes max on this. Okay. Um, Jane was on to say on Twitter, how you doing, Jane? My cousin took SEACT and the tumour shrunk because it was too big to operate. The surgeon said it was a miracle. However, there was an operation, uh, then chemo, and eventually my cousin died, says Jane. Jane, that's a tragedy. If um, your cousin was taking the tea and that impact, you know, that positive impact of the tumour sh- shrinking, that is a, a tragedy. Loads of people in on this. Alex says you might as well tr- throw CBD uh, oil in at the same time, get her, get her money's worth. He was also asking about uh, GC math as well. Um, Zana in New Zealand has been tweeting out that prayer, by the way. I've got a lovely <laughs> image with that prayer, which I've just retweeted as well. Uh, thanks very much for that, Zana. Uh, Manrique says bicarbonate of soda or lemon juice with water and that was the extent of his tweet so uh, I take it Manrique, Man, Manrique even that you're saying that you know that's, that's, that's a healthy thing to do mm. Wayne says I give up with the ignorance of people if these things were one off then fine but it's generation after generation loads of people interested in bicarbonate and Jean Ann asks about clause 4 isn't this what Morris Saatchi was trying for after Josephine Hart's death to change the allowing of alternative treatments by passing Absolutely. a bill through the Lords? Absolutely. Great memory, Jean Anne. I should remember that. Spot on. Yeah, she's spot on. Um, Lord Saatchi was so horrified at watching the, what his darling wife had to go through and tried to get rid of this through the legislation he was going to bring in through the House of Lords and it got thrown out. Just got thrown out. You see, Julia, you know, I understand you do occasionally hear this particular programme. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a strange case because I came from, you know, the most, uh, the, the most, I suppose, the most obvious mainstream background. This sort of thing years ago, I would have been very rude now. Mm. Uh, I interviewed people like you on uh, commercial radio years ago and mm. I, was, I wasn't rude, but I, you know, I had a job to do and that job was to discredit you. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, I would, that, I, would you know? be, I would be the same. Yeah. If I hadn't have gone through what I've gone through, you know, I used to dismiss this stuff as hippie quack bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. You know, I was too, an yeah. out and out sceptic and totally anti anyone who spoke out as just you have no idea what you're talking about. Get back in your box or go and sit in a field. You know, Get your tinfoil hat out. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And it's only because of what... I, and you see, but you see, the other thing is, is I think cancer is a gift because to my mind, it gives you the opportunity to reevaluate your life and where you are out of alignment with yourself. That's been said to me by Mike Lambert, David's friend on the Isle of Wight, the Shen Clinic, Mike, who gave me the most disgusting powder four <laughs> years ago in London when I was complaining of a duodenal ulcer, which came back every now and then. Uh, brought on by that crazy lifestyle that you described there, uh, Julia. Mike said, if you take this, you might, once in a blue moon, you might have a bit of acid indigestion, but you'll never again, you know, um, vomit blood. I don't want to put our listeners off if they're eating their dinner. And you'll never again pass blood because of your ulcer. Mm-hmm. What is it, Mike? Add to such and such a thing, some sort of plant, blah, 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 blah. And David was living with me at the time and David said, uh, I know you won't take that. He said, you just wasted Mike's time. And I didn't take it for weeks. And then I mixed it then in water a few times and, and took it. And that was the end of that. Mm. Happy days. And I mm. suppose that was the final, that was the final realisation for me, the final incident, the final bit of proof that I needed that, you know, there, you know, I knew nothing or, or you know, everything I thought I knew was in fact uh, not right. They're never going, your campaign is absolutely valiant and it's commendable, but there is no way the pharmaceutical companies are ever going to allow a situation whereby clause four is chucked out because it opens um, the world up to people like you and and others. who Um, The millions of us. Millions, that's absolutely right, millions. And funnily enough, as we're talking now, uh, Jane or, or Sean tweeted, 
What about natural cures being attacked through genetically modified crop contamination? That's a brilliant comment, that. Yeah, that is a spot on comment. Yeah, and another, I, yeah. I, I personally, you know, you, yes, GMO foods, I mean, or, you know, there's another huge topic in itself. However, what I have been shown that our bodies can come back from when given the opportunity to do so, not only including sort of taking stuff, but also from within, sitting with self is an expression. Meditation is huge. Whether people want to acknowledge it or not, I really don't care. But I've just had enough of watching people who don't want to die, die needlessly. We have a meditation every Monday, follows this programme by a woman who... Uh, I imagine you'd get on very well with uh, a British woman called Kim Hutchison who lives in Germany. And um, her um, work is very much aligned with what you do. And it's a wonderful thing. And again, something I would have laughed at before. Yeah, likewise. I was a proper, bu- I, 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 never a bully. I never bullied anybody in my life. But when it came to stuff like this, I was a bully boy, you know. What oh, a I load was, of bollocks, you know. I just used to laugh. I mean, I think yeah. this is actually ultimately a big cosmic joke because I was one of those people who just laughed this stuff out of town. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, um, another big element also that one has to look at is your energy anatomy. Now, this has now been scientifically proven to exist. And um, Here I'm talking about meridians. I'm talking about chakras and subtle bodies. Meridians in particular have an almighty effect on our not only our physical well-being, but also our emotional and mental well-being. Now, the Chinese know a thing or two about medicine. And they've really got it right where the meridian system is concerned, hence the effectiveness of acupuncture. And it's, to my mind, there is no one thing. You have to look at your diet. You've got to look at your nutrition. You've got to look at your lifestyle. You've got to look at your geopathic environment. You have to look at where you are within yourself and preventative care. That doesn't mean mean you have to become neurotic, but I feel water, dehydration, the pH balance of the body, how you are with yourself, because, you know, there's the emotional element which suggests that cancer is a form of eating away at self. Get rid of sugar out of your diet. The little things that you can do yourself, you know. I'm going going to have to call a halt to this, but I'm going to ask you to come back on soon. What I want to ask you before we go, though, is yes. it's been fascinating. Thanks for coming on, Julia. Pleasure. Is um, Chris Piper, how are you, Chris? Chris is a vegan. That's not anything to do with his um, question. But um, we are talking veganism next week on the programme, folks. And I've gotten myself one of those Nutri-Bullet things. I'm going to try the juice diet. Uh, Joe Cross, I'm going to try one of these juice programmes. And um, I, they're, they're I, good, but for a short while only. For a short know? while only, that's right. Yeah, I don't um, drink very much. I've never smoked. And I run five kilometres a day, so I'm in good shape. But I'm going to have a go. I'm going to have a go at veganism for a bit of months. See how I get on with it. Uh, no, I really am. For a bit of months, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do a video diary at the same time. Um, oh, my big you. ugly body, yeah. Now, please ask Julia, says Chris, what does the Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine do? Is it simply homeopathic or is it fully integrative? The Royal London Hospital for Integrated Medicine, described as the largest public sector provider in Europe. What is it, quickly? I don't know. (laughs) Good answer, the honesty. But I'm very happy to find out and send you an email. And come back and report on it. Yeah. When we pick up these issues again. What I'm going to say is, you've got my email, and if I've put together a document on all the key information I have discovered in the last 20 years on all the different forms of treatment, preventative care, any that I feel have validity to them. And if anyone wants it to me, I'm, and you ve- I'm very happy for you to give my email out and I will happily email them out to people. Julia, that, um, that's brilliant. I really appreciate that. I will tweet it out there for people. I know your website has been under attack and yeah. you're having difficulties with it. I'm not surprised by that. Um, but um, I'll invite you back in about six weeks and we'll do a longer segment and All we'll right, take lovely. questions and answers because we've had a lot of tweets and emails come in there. Yeah, I'd love to help anyone I can. I'm here to serve, you know. And good. Well, thanks for that. And good luck with um, the campaigning for Clause 4 and the Cancer Act of 1939. Yeah, if anyone wants to sign the... Um, I've got a petition going on, Avas, because if we get 100,000 signatures... 
then it has to be debated in the House of Commons. Can't wait to talk to you again. Thanks for the education, Bless Julia. You, I really enjoyed it. now, and you take care. Look after yourself. Bye for now. Uh, Julia Fairfax on the line to us there. Uh, she's in London.